It's right. all about access. It's all about opportunity. It's all about reach. Absolutely. You know what I mean? If you can see it, you can be. If you don't know it exists, you don't know what you don't know. You're absolutely Unless right. Unless you're, you know, and some, there's some uniqueness to it. Like, I am going to be an astronaut. I don't know. A astronaut, I haven't seen myself. But it just goes back to the idea of just access, opportunity, resources. If someone gives you a glimpse into it. Oh, yeah. The whole world opens up. I was just told yeah. to be a certain way. Yeah. But now I'm in my 20s. I'm in my 30s. Sometimes 40s to figure it out and kind of go, am I going against nature or am I going against nurture? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is Chaz and welcome to my world from my living room. Today, we're gonna to talk to my aunt Zachary. We're gonna talk about how she's changing narratives for the better in the black community. Her earlier years building cars in Detroit and how she's building her media empire. So sit back, relax, and welcome to my world from my living room. So today, oh my God, you guys have <laughs> no idea what it took to get this amazing <laughs> woman here in my living room. This is amazing. My good friend, my aunt Zachary. What is up, girl? What's cracking? <laughs> As we say in Detroit, what up, though? Right, what up, though? What, <laughs> what up, though? Up, though? <laughs> so so uh, let's get into this. Let's. So my aunt, so, um, you know, Coming from Detroit, obviously we're talking about the Motor City thing. Mm -hmm. um, also, I met you through Wendell. Yes. Yes. Wendell Jones, who is a guru of sorts and a friend to many, but very selective in all the things, <laughs> um, introduced me to this amazing woman because he was like, you need to meet Maat. You need to meet Maat because y'all are crazily similar in your <laughs> your creative pursuits as it relates to like oh you performed oh she did too oh you did this oh she did too she created a vector so is she <laughs> it's like oh my god okay so introduce me to my and we we had such a short um we had a small brief encounter but it was like so intense it was like it was like we're both yeah. showing each other our like things, you know what I mean? And I love that because I'm like, it's great to see a woman in this space and just killing it on so many levels. Yeah. We were fast friends. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think fast so. Fast friends, you know, I think it's, uh, so I'm not one to get out a lot. I know. And, and that, we're working on that. We're working on that. <laughs> so when I get out, I want to get out with a purpose. I understand. You know what I mean? And I it understand. needs to, you know, it just needs to have the right mix. Right. You know. Of course. And so that was the thing when we met. I was like, oh, oh, these are my people. Right. Oh, okay, we in here. Right, Hi. right. Hi. <laughs> Boy, yes, yeah. I see you. And then I ain't see you for a long time after that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> right back in. Right, right back in. <laughs> Um, but no, but during that time, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm checking you out a little bit more because, you know, you meet someone, you know, for face value and you're like, okay, I got all the things, but your mm. mind is so preoccupied by being present in that moment. You're not doing any sort of like, oh, well, who is she? Or, who is he? Or, mm -hmm. you know, how that whole thing works. But I think, you know, me understanding the power that you wield in your life and in the space of your expertise, um, which is... Storytelling. Storytelling. Which is definitely, I like to say, it was one of mine as well. Uh, as a photographer, as a singer-songwriter, mm. as I used to dance too. You used to dance. I used to and, dance. And choreograph some big yes. productions and travel worldwide. Yes. And I'm like, that sounds eerily familiar. But it's great to meet you in that space because it gives me hope that it's not doing too much. <sighs> <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't think it's doing too much in the things that um, we did and how we got there and finding self. I think it's just a unique journey. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have so many gifts, desires, dreams, right, right to mm -hmm. pursue. And I think like in my journey, it was from from time, from youth, I always knew that Creativity and creative was my thing. I always wanted to be a star. You uh, know what I mean? I wanted yeah. to dance. I wanted to Debbie Allen. I wanted to be on Fame. I wanted to oh be on God, Star Search. Oh I wanted to, to go to, to the school with Leroy and them. Yes. Oh Please. My God. Like, oh, that yes. was it. Yeah. Um, 
I love Felicia Richard yes. on the Cosby Show. I love The Wiz. You mm-hmm. know, just mm-hmm. Michael Jack. Like we had an era so rich in quality mm-hmm. arts and music and um, coming up in that space that you saw yourself there. Right. I saw myself there, but I knew here right. that it was a thing that I could do and I wanted to do. And uh, I just, I just think there was, it would be not right not to pursue it, not to go after it, or not to be honest, not to listen to your heart. Right. And that was my heart, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, speaking. And I think everyone, especially, we know who we are when we're young. Right. We just get told we're somebody different. Right. Because I think in the world. Absolutely. Too. I mean, I think that's just. It's one of those things you always fight yourself. You fight what you've always known mm. when you know better. So I say that from a place of we have our family and our and our parents that kind of raise us and rear us in mm-hmm. a way that they feel we should go, right? But then when we leave the confines and the safety of home, we get to a place where we're like, wait, I'm nothing like that. I was just told yeah. to be a certain way. Yeah. But now... <clears throat> I'm in my 20s, I'm in my 30s, sometimes 40s, to figure it out and kind of go, am I going against nature or am I going against nurture? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, because we get in our heads, right? Because we're like, if you've always known it and it's always been something to where you you feel like that's your calling, but then something else comes in the way. You're like, wait, but I kind of like that. Because we're multifaceted. If it, if, is it wrong to like that too? Now we're in social media where, you know, we got all these colloquialisms. Oh, you're doing too much. Oh, you're doing that. And you have all these different, what I call chicken and the eagle, sort of. Okay. Where the chickens are looking up in the air like, oh, psh, you can't fly. You know, but then you're like. Little do they know, you roll down from an eagle's nest and rolled into a chicken coop. <laughs> and like, you look like you, you're amongst them, but you're not of them, right? Yes. So then you look up, you're like, I want to fly. You're like, wait, you're one of us? You can't fly? But now we have that same thing going on right now. If you do too much, you almost get stared into mediocrity. So let's talk about too much. What yeah. do we mean by doing too much? Mm-hmm. Um, because we're in a space where you should be multitasking. <clears throat> Um, multi-hyphenated, right. multi-faceted. Um, you should go and be on the grind and and all these different things. And you know, if you're not out here with the, I can't even remember the one of the one of the colloquialisms about um, you know, grind hard, hustle we, we hard, out here. hustle harder, all of those things. Right. What's too much as it relates to like how what you're doing in your life day to day versus too much just being too big because you're so you have so many facets that you can actually activate and actuate on. So which one are we saying? Well, I mean, I think I think there's a a general path. And I only say general because when you're in grade school, you got to be smart enough to get into college. Mm -hmm. Then you get into college, you got to you have to be specific as to what you want to do with the Mm -hmm. rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So then you have to specialize in something so then you allocate all your energy within four years yes. and then you leave those four walls into real world into real life to find out that i didn't really want to do that in the first place because <laughs> i i went to school in like you know wisconsin or some random place but now i live in new york that current that is is indirect currency to where i'm going versus where i'm at at the time Yes. Right? So you learned four years, but what did you learn in those four years? Did that prepare you for another place that your ambition t- took you? I think a couple things. So I think that four-year um, track mm-hmm. um, is definitely <clears throat> this four years to prove that I got a receipt, mm. right, okay. for being focused on something specifically. My mm. degree is a receipt. Right, and it wasn't necessarily something that was hands-on experience mm-hmm. to say that it's going to work in the real world and is it usable. Right. Um, I think that's why it's important for like for myself. I did an internship, and then I did a co-op. I did an intern with uh, Anheuser Busch, mm. and I stayed with them for uh, almost two semesters to get hands-on experience as an engineer. Got it. And then I came, and then I did. Um, 
an internship with GM before hiring in with them full time. Mm -hmm. And so those actually gave me a glimpse and insight into what it actually looked like. Depending on what university you go to and how the university is set up, I find that are you making me an employee or an employer? Ah. And most of our schools make us employees. Right. Not the employer. Right. And so now we didn't learn about business from a perspective of being the, the owner. Right. You learn from being a subordinate. To being a, yes. Interesting. Exactly. And Interesting. that's a key difference, I think, just looking at how we, certain universities, certain Ivy Leagues, certain HBCUs, just period across the board. When you really look at what are they really training, because it's one thing to learn a specialization. Mm -hmm. Mine was engineering. I was a mechanical engineer, came out, built cars, see all those things. As a mechanical engineer, I went in first as an aerospace mm -hmm. engineer wow. um, and shifted to mechanical. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about like, um, what did the future look for me, look like for me in the workforce when I came out? And I was like, oh, hold on. That's a little bit. Right. <laughs> Let me go on over here where I have a little bit more ways to spread. Right, you know right, what I mean? Right. Um, and so that's why I shifted. But I've learned now... Even thinking about people who like dropped out of college and have not become, you know, millionaires, billionaires, and things like that. <clears throat> Minus uh, the millionaire, me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm and I'm specific not to say names, sure. right? Mm -hmm. But just the concept of it is that they have an opportunity to look at it from an entrepreneur's eye, or just follow that dream, mm -hmm. right, and go after it, versus the opposite. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just about. In that specialization, we're taught to do that versus taught to listen to the brain. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, go after the that. And it really depends on the culture in which you come up. That's true. Because I think true. our culture is like they taught us what they knew. Right. And, you know, they did the best that they could with the information that we knew. It's right. all about access. It's all about opportunity. It's all about reach. Absolutely. You know what I mean? If you can see it, you can be. If you don't know it exists, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You're absolutely Unless right. you're, you know, and some there's some uniqueness to it. Like I am going to be an astronaut. Right. I don't know a astronaut. I haven't seen myself, but it just goes back to the idea of just access, opportunity, resources. If someone gives you a glimpse into it, oh yeah, the whole world opens up. Well, you know, I think that I think that's almost an animalistic, um, you know, mindset. And I say that from the standpoint I just got a, a new little kitty. Uh, his <laughs> name His name is Echo. And what's interesting? Great name. Yeah, um, my wife named him. I will not take credit for that. But okay. I love, <laughs> I love uh, Echo. But I only reference that because I think, for example, the bathroom. We're kind of making some no, you know, no Hands zone sort of places. Yeah. His curiosity of things that he's not not supposed to do reigns true a lot more than the things that is free and open. Right. Mm. So you talk about that access. If I close the bathroom door and he knows what he's already seen inside, his interest is a lot more because now he's looking at that door waiting for it to open mm -hmm. because he sees something that may not have necessarily been for him. But his curiosity is peaked to the nth degree because he's like, I want to experience that again. It's like us having that access to various things that were historically told that was white. And then one day we see someone else doing it. We see someone like, you know, uh, Jesse Owens. We see someone mm -hmm. in a white dominated thing. And then it's like, once you open that door, then you're going to start letting us all in. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we changed the whole paradigm. Absolutely. I'm looking at I'm looking at the NFL right now. I don't know if you're into sports, but anyway, NFL well, how about right the, now. How about those Lions, though? Oh, Detroit, my city. How about those Lions? <laughs> so, how about that? But look, but, but but you know what's crazy? Just to think back when back in my day, uh, when I was watching <laughs> when I was watching when I was watching Doug Williams mm -hmm. win the Super Bowl for the Washington Redskins, right? That was Pandora's box open, but he was also an anomaly. So now I'm looking at the NFL today. For so many years, it's been Tom Brady, Peyton yeah. Manning, yes. uh, John Elway. It's been all these, you know, white quarterbacks mm -hmm. that kind of were the face of the NFL. I'm sorry. Now, guess who's the face? Now we got Patrick Mahomes mm -hmm. that's about to play Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. 
the whole game has changed because they let us in. The other thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because right, because you could not have us in leadership positions like that. No, right. it's funny. I was just talking to my, my dad was talking to me about this, right? I'm not mm -hmm. a sports head, but he we were talking about mm -hmm. that and just like the 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 critical role of the quarterback and what mm -hmm. does that mean, of, you know, on a larger scale and what did that look like? Not to to put everything on color, but let's like not say it doesn't exist, right? right? Exactly. And when people say, you know, I don't see color. Right. Uh, right. Stop it. Um, <laughs> and so to that point, like who wanted to then have to follow leadership? Right. Because this is a leadership conversation. Sure. That quarterback is the leader. You have to take direction. Right. Suggestions. Right. Orders. Mm -hmm. Who wants to do that? And that's bigger than just the game, but it's also built in the game. So mm -hmm. when, I, when you say that, you know, that's why we, we don't let it in. But also to go back to just giving someone a glimpse like Echo. Right. Right. I right. want it again. Or yeah. Or I can do it. Or it's possible. Right. So you're not putting placing limits. Sure. Or you're not designing systemically. Right. To make sure that you can't get in. Right. And I've seen that in so many other places. I've seen it. Yeah. In so many other places. I so tell me so tell me about that. So you being a creative director, you've worked on numerous commercials, um, you know, films, um, a lot of content. When you found yourself in this content space, where did you feel that maybe you were pushing the envelope and actually going to a place where you're like, this may it feels a little risky, but you know what? I'm gonna be passionate about this and really push forward. And, and did it make an impact? And, and if it did, how'd you celebrate that? Um, hmm. I know there was a lot to unpack it, it there, wasn't. my bad. I actually have an answer <laughs> I want to say, but I'm going to say it. I, I think when we're talking about access to getting in the door, I think that I, um, I did a lot of execution in the earlier parts of my career and that development was the thing that was held back. Mm, Couldn't right. get let into development. Got it because that's where decisions are made, ideas are created, stories are told, seats at the table, as we say. Right. Right? And um, those points of view or perspectives are then considered. But also a lot of control and a lot of impact is made there. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, once I got into development, finally, you mm -hmm. know, it was like looking and pulling back the, the door on the on the whiz. Right. Like, Oh. Is that you? You know what right. I mean? <laughs> right. Uh, what was it? Um, with Richard Pryor and you, he got exposed. You know, when you get back there, you're like, this is what it is? Right. Oh, uh, gotcha. You know right. what I mean? Um, there's some there's some great opportunities and there's some great aspects in development and, and in everything. You learn the business. You learn the lexicon, you know, mm -hmm. the language. Sure. Um, and then how the business runs. And then once you see it, you go, oh, like you just said, the Jesse Owens of it, once we get in, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that comes to mind as it relates to me seeing it in this particular industry. I've experienced it in the many industries that I've been in. Mm -hmm. And then you asked me, what did I push the envelope on a concept or something? That yeah, and really brought it to life. And maybe, you know, it succeeded maybe far beyond what you may have thought it would. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. or, or if it did, you know, where'd y'all go to eat afterwards? Like, I mean, you know, right, where was right, 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 right. I got, you know, I have a, I have a few of them, but uh -huh. one that comes to mind is, um, <laughs> there I love a, that smile, by the way. There was a, smile is incredible. <laughs> thank you. There was a concept that when I first started in advertising and in developing and creating ideas, I was very timid. Mm. Right. Um, because there's a lot to learn and to understand how to take your idea and then be able to pitch it mm. effectively. And you get right. one time to pitch and then having all of the elements that make up your pitch and your story, especially in advertising, that everyone's um, agenda is considered. Right. And that you're able to take your idea, conceive it and get it to paper mm -hmm. where it's understandable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and then did you take all of the other pieces that, that drive this piece to distribution? That's the business element of it. So right. it's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. So I was very timid on that. And I would um, pitch up ideas. And I remember pitching up one of my first ideas. And um, there is an art to storytelling, yeah. right? There is an art to being able to um, meet, create win-wins, mm -hmm. right? In the story right. for you as a storyteller, are you ultimately designing for the end user 
And then have you considered the other folks that right. has to come in this story? So I remember pitching up something and I'm always for the underdog, right? right. So let's just say this piece was called The Underdog. Okay. And um, the idea went over and then someone saw it and um, they liked it. When we pitched it, they liked it. I was very timid when I pitched it. Actually, I let somebody else pitch it. Oh. Right. Oh, okay. There's steps to this. There's yeah. levels. You just don't come through the door like I'm about to pitch my joint. Yo, right, right. You don't. <laughs> exactly. You don't, right? Exactly. Um, and so I let somebody else pitch it, and the uh, the client liked it. They mm. liked it a lot. And um, we went back, and now you say, hey, we are interested. Go back, and you do your rewrite, and you're going to come back with another in. And uh, when we went back to the drawing board, people were like, I want to change the name, right? It was like, we're going to change it from the underdogs to the Vanguard. Mm. I'm like, I don't feel that. Mm. Why the Vanguard, right? Because we're, we're talking about, at the time, we were speaking about first-generation immigrant college students. Mm. They are the underdogs. Right, right. Right, but we're gonna flip it to make a positive, which wasn't true for their experience. Right. They weren't seen as the Vanguard, right? I see. And so that's like one small element. This story can go on, but I won't. Right. Um, <laughs> but that was like one element of it, right? And then so we ended up switching it to um, to the Vanguard, um, pitching it, and it just kind of the idea got away from me. Wow. So many people got into, and the idea just yeah. kind of, you know, morphed into something different, which wasn't where I started. It's amazing how mm -hmm. some of those moments um, happen. It kind of almost sterilizes the art. So coming from my vantage point, I was a part of a um, I was a part of a show that ended up going to um, I want to say a black box theater mm -hmm. that it was actually being shopped. You understand that mm -hmm. concept. Uh, where a show was being shopped, um, it was a concept, right? It was a concept show, but it was really, really, I mean, they were looking to have this win Tony's and go on Broadway and the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was that the show, I don't want to say too much because somebody may be, somebody may steal it I know, there. this is so funny it's having crazy. this conversation because I'm like self-editing, like, Ooh. I know, you're right. <laughs> Someone's they're going to know exactly like, what's at. The yeah. bottom line was <laughs> that it was a show about, um, about addiction. And it had a very unique vantage point and in a very unique way of spelling that out through the course of um, the show. And we did this thing and it was emotional. Everybody was crying. People in the audience, they were crying. It was like, oh my God, this thing is gonna work because it, it, it just brought you on a roller coaster. And it was so interesting. This was live theater? It was live theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was an actor and I played four different roles. Come on now. Yeah, and, and that was really fun. And it was like, okay, I'm not a Broadway person, but I, I feel all these different emotions and I feel all these different things at various times in my life. So it kind of made sense, right? And so um, long story short, the producers got together and the original concept, the original creator came in with this beautiful, well thought out plan. And then you had all the producers get their hands in it. Everybody mm -hmm. takes a bite out of it. Almost like a piranha to like, you know, something in the water where everybody just kind of takes a bite out of it until there's nothing left. And see, so that's the thing now, like for me in, in the storytelling, it is what's authentic, what resonates with your particular audience. And who are you talking to? So who is the work for? Right. And that is like the main key. And I think it's always like the North Star. Mm -hmm. Who am I talking to? Because right. we all can be feeling really good in the development space on this and you get to the audience and it doesn't land. Why? Because it wasn't authentic. It didn't resonate with them and you didn't consider them. Right. 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 And at the end of the day, what started off as a good idea ended up being a bad one. Right. Right. It's same thing with the idea I just, with the note I just gave earlier about the story. Sure. And so guess what? I had to, I just relinquished it and we, they, we, all the, all of they're not piranhas because I love these people so. <laughs> but they did their thing, and the idea was no longer what I what I wanted, what right. I what it was. And so I went back and just pitched another idea behind it. Now here's the note again. I didn't pitch it. Right. Right. I just gave it up and pitched, even to the point when I said, "Hey guys, let's just throw this last idea in there." And they were like, "We're going to pitch it. They're probably not going to buy it." Literally said it. Mm. They're probably not going to buy it, um, but we're going to pitch it anyway. And so they pitched it. They pitched the old, the, the, the new Vanguard, and they pitched the idea. Um, and 
it was like, when it went in the door, it was like, oh, they're probably not going to buy it. I was like, word? That's the energy we're putting on it? Okay, cool. All righty. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. At the end of the day, it ends up being the thing that they bought. Yeah. That's amazing. And it amazing. ends up being the piece with Regina King in it. Oh, wow. It's that That's piece. amazing. And it ends up being called, it's called the first. The first generation immigrant students to go to college. It's a simple name. It's called the first. That's beautiful. I just wanted to take this moment to thank each and every one of you all for joining me right here in my living room. I know it's a different format than your typical podcast, but this is something that felt really natural and organic for me uh, to be able to share my most authentic self with you. The people who I've invited to my home are people that allow me to think a little bit differently, and they also inspire me. And I hope they do for you as well. So if you would, hit the subscribe button, Leave me a comment and a question. Till then, let's continue this conversation. Regina King, yo, that is crazy. Because mm. truth be told, I mean, she was probably like a huge crush of mine back when she was on 227. Am I dating myself to say that? Just a little bit, but I, 227? Heard, I, I remember 227. You remember 227? Okay. Sandra. Okay, okay. All right, because she had hazel eyes. She, and she, yeah. had, mm-hmm. and she, she had those beautiful eyes on that beautiful brown skin. She I was like, really, yes. oh my God, I'm like, Regina King was everything. And with that pressed hair. That, you know what? <laughs> so funny. I just it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I just saw it last night. She just had her 53rd birthday. Yes. I was like, wow, yes. Regina's 53. Wow. 53 you know, books I just of Regina. I just turned 5 Come on. Hey. Boom, 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 boom. Go 50. Right? I know. No, I would have given, given 40. Really? Yeah, I would have well, given you, 40. Love. I would have given 40. You know 40. how we do. You know how yeah. we do. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that because you say that that Regina King thing went through so many different levels to get to where it is, and it became one of your favorite pieces. It sounds like, based on your energy about it. It was one of my um, major first wins. Mm. Re- remember, there was a timidity <clears throat> right? when I first got into this space of storytelling and pushing. There was a lot in just the, the storytelling, the pitching, the um, really believing in your concept because it goes through so many touch points. There's so right. many things that fold into the conversation. And then the beauty of it is that watching it morph into the things that we wanted it to be also was able to... Um, hire and layer in a, a, a writer, a mm-hmm. writers who were able to pitch their concepts to bring this idea together. We did two or three different people. This is what I love what I do. I get yeah. to then uh, empower, employ, collaborate with other creatives, really hire folks who you can lift their expertise out of it. Mm. Just because I created the idea and I know I wanted it to be a voiceover that would, had a poetic flair, I went and hired someone who is literally a poet. Right. Right? We went and auditioned a few well-known poets. Right. Then I even got somebody who was a poet, uh, not necessarily on the influencer level, but a poet had been a poet for like 15 years in Detroit. And then we had a voice of a... So this is a beauty, right? I had the voice, the perspective of a male, a perspective of a female, right? right? Mm-hmm. And then we did it, and and then we did a mashup of it to make sure that the brand was aligned with it, right? And it was right. like matchmaking, mm-hmm. um, you know, creative matchmaking and being right. like a cupid to you know to the point. And we were able to mash up, match it up, and then give it to Regina and say, Regina, how do you feel about it? Right. 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 Um, and uh, then Regina read it, and then she says, "This means a lot to me." Wow. Yeah. As a mother. You know what I mean? And so she loved it and took a liking to it because Mm -hmm. what it was about, right? And I'm I'm just thinking about it later. I look at so many things. There's things that I've shot and those people aren't on the planet anymore. Wow. And they were really like cultural moments of realness. And that's the thing about being, bringing my heart to the work, to the storytelling. Right. Um, Because I got, I have the, I'm fortunate enough to be a voice of the culture. Yeah. I write for me. Sure. I am the audience just like everybody else. And I'm just thinking about that and that just hit me like, wow. I definitely understand that process, um, especially when it comes down to when it no longer becomes yours per se, it becomes everyone else's. Isn't that what it's supposed to do though? 
Yeah, it is. But 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 I'm talking about from the genesis. At the end of, right, at the end of the day. Right. Yes. So from my vantage point, I can honestly say, like, from the songwriting standpoint mm. of storytelling, right? So that part of storytelling for me came in the form of um, I had this great song concept, right? And I have the melody. I can sing the melody, and it feels good to my soul. It feels good to my, my bones, right? Um, and I'm like, oh, this is good, but I don't play any instruments. So I can mm -hmm. sing the melody, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a song about my son, which is the epitome of anything I would ever want to write because I want to write from the space of a black father standpoint um, that's raising a young black boy in this new world. And if you know you, then you know right. the, that, what your son means to you. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. So me, you know, I can have all the great intentions I want with writing and crafting the right lyric, making it personal enough, but also making it universal, you know, to reach other fathers in the world. Um, and so for me, when I wrote this song, I'm like, it's a great concept, it's a great song, but I needed to find those other people to help bring it to life musically. The right piano player, the right guitarist, the right percussionist, the right thing that had, the right people that brought all those elements to life which mm -hmm. still gave me the authentic feel of where it came from here, I needed to have that throughout the whole life of its process. Yeah, exactly. Right? So then in turn, then I created a video concept and a treatment. And I did all this stuff during COVID. Nice. And so... Um, You're being productive. Being productive, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, that meant a lot to me because... I knew that it took more than me to bring it to life because I may have had the idea and yeah, great song. It's about a father and son. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cute. Great, con you know, but I don't want it to just be cute. I want it to be impactful. Facts and creativity is a team sport. Right. That's why we, we, we say the word. Now you hear it a lot about collaboration, but mm -hmm. we literally are just, uh, as human beings, we yeah. need each other. We feed off of each other. We connect that way. And people's expertise, superpowers, if I'm just being very, very business level in the context sure. of it, but mm -hmm. just as as beings, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's what we do every day. That's what that is. That, that's what that thing was when, when we met. We were f fast friends. Right. You know? It's the vibe. Yeah. And we can't discount that, but you also can't discount the the baby and creativity. Right. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that relationship, that relational need. Everyone, mm -hmm. I need, I need, I need you to, you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, trap jam, like jazz. Right. Come on. Right, Come right. on, play that music. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, wait, right. wait, keep going, you know what I mean? Right. It is, it's that. So tell me, you know, so me coming from Nashville and you coming from Detroit, now we're both here in New York, right? Mm-hmm. Now, New York is a different beast because for me, for the longest time, whether it be because I didn't trust anybody, whether it because I felt I was better at doing it myself, whether it be all these other factors, I've done 90% of everything I've ever created on my own. So I'm coming to New York where everybody's on their, on their grind, right? So how is it for you trying to get someone else to honor and or buy into your dream, knowing that they have one themselves. Because everybody's on their own thing. Mm -hmm. To have someone come in on your thing, somebody's gotta give up something somewhere, whether it be ego, whether it be work, whether it be you know, um, their expertise, their knowledge. There's an exchange there. How do you feel your journey has been like in New York with that in mind? <sighs> yeah, <laughs> right. New York is a different animal. It is a highly competitive city. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about friends and who you know in my network and then no new friends after that, right? Mm. Um, so you, it's very cliquish in right. that I have my my crew. Um, we have, in some way, shape, or form, have an unwritten understanding that I'm going to support you and you're going to support me. I saw that the most clearest at NYU in their film school. Mm. I was doing some work there and I spoke there and um, was also hiring at the time I was casting. 
Um, this is when I was an actor, right? And right. I was casting for films when I was shooting before I got into this other part of the business. And um, I noticed how they worked together as a team. And um, they all wanted to be a director or a writer or something, but they had to work on projects together. And then from school, then they left and then became that same crew when they got out in the real world right. and started shooting each other's work right. creatively. So right. one would, I'm going to DP this, I'm going to PA this, I'm going to line produce that, I'm going to bring my lights from this, I'm going to pull this over. And I saw that unity mm -hmm. um, that when I first got here, unless you were literally accepted into somebody's friend group, you really weren't getting that type of love and support. Yeah. And that was something that made the journey really hard. Right. A, um, B, like, it's probably um, had a lot to do with how I'm still in the house a lot, way before the pandemic. Right. Because you really had to be one who knew somebody and be in the know. And I, I think much like you, moved here. I didn't know a soul when I moved here. Not nobody. Yeah. I picked up and came to this big old city. Right. And said that I was going to take it by storm, you know. Yeah. Um, and it let me know what it was. And to this day, I've gotten so many compliments at this point. I think the the, the best compliment I ever got was from my father, mm. maybe about four years ago, who was completely against New York, just on hmm. the history of who they are, who they are as, as a municipal city with police and firemen, how they right. handle folks, you know, he, he'll take you through the ringer. Sure. And he's like, you did it. Yeah. You still there. You managed to really be successful there. Yeah. And I that was a that was such a tender compliment from him. Um that most people I know who came here are gone. Even folks be like, yeah. You still there? Right. Oh, I don't know how you did that. <laughs> you know Are you still still there? It's such a thing, right? Because, you know, I could speak to that from the standpoint of, you know, my mother, right? Which actually I have a podcast that she's on this very couch as well um, that I'm excited about um, where she wanted me to come home and get that good, safe government job. That's right. And to make sure you she okay. saw me, she made sure I was okay. But then also she, you know, once she saw my first commercial, once she saw all these different things mm -hmm. from her living room, okay? And so she's seeing I different things that. and she's seeing you know, my excitement and my joy. And then she's seeing, you know, we have a son and we be a great dad. It's like, we're in a space right now where we seek validation on some level, whether we want to or, you know, or not. And so- All the time. And social media and everything, but nothing beats that attention, that compliment, that like, that comment from our family. From your, from your, and uh, for you to say your father, period. that's a beautiful thing because when I say my mom, it's because there was mine as a father. So mm. for me to say, to have my mom say well done, and for me well to done, sit son. here and embrace a beautiful conversation as a new 50 year old, talking to my mom on my couch in my living room, <laughs> that is a beautiful moment. So I can that only is, imagine how it was is. for your dad to, to, to give you that well done. That well done, sort of yeah. I think because yeah. we all, at the end of the day, it, everyone says what they want, but we always want to make our parents proud. Yeah. If you have them both, whomever it is, you want to make them proud. And especially when you do like a drastic move, specifically like to New York or LA, you want to prove that you can make it right. to yourself and to them. And Absolutely. It, and it was a rough road. They were like, I, at <laughs> any point in time, you know, you can leave. Right. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I stuck it out and... Um, for me, I think that song about um, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Really? It's fact. It is fact on yeah. fact on fact. And and for me, like for my idea of making it in New York after being here for so long was making it in New York meant that I have two homes. Mm. I have a home in the city and I have a home upstate. Gotcha. And both of those homes. If, yeah. I, if they both don't have a car. Yeah. At least I have two dwellings because that is what it seems to be really have be established in New York. Right. You know, yeah. as a married or a single, you have a getaway. Right. You come to New York and live that New York lifestyle, which everyone comes and says, oh, I don't know how y'all do it here. Right. When I tell people that New York minute is real. Yeah. It is real. Yeah. But then soon as we all know when the holiday comes or the weekends or long summers, you know, everyone's out. Yeah. 
right? That's true. And that's and that you come here and they all people come on the holiday and say it's not so bad here. It's quiet, right? Because everyone's gone and the, right. city, gone. the city is sleeping, right? In their way of sleep, right? right. And so to me, um, I'm still striving to get two homes hey. that you can afford, right? In right. New York, you right about that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I mean, it was a similar path for me when I was in Nashville. And I was, you know, cutting my teeth in adulthood and, and everything. And, and people were looking at me like, Chaz, what are you doing here? Whether it be some of my haters and or competition. In, like, Tennessee, in, what in, you, Tennessee? in Nashville, yeah. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, you know, what are you still doing here, man? You're bigger than the city. You're sandbagging. Oh. Like, it's that whole thing. It's like, because yeah. I'm, I'm the cool black yeah. dude on the scene, right? Yeah. And I'm in all the different places, right? So I have people wishing me well that I should be somewhere else. And then, yeah. I, then I have some that aren't wishing me well. They just want me to get out of here. So, you know. They can make, we can make room right. for them. <laughs> you taking room. up space, bro. So, so then, you know, you know, um, then I have some of those people that are that have well wished me for, for this long. I'm kind of living their dream because they may have come here or Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And they're back in six months. That's it. That's and you. So, you are. You. That's true. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so here I am. They see me living my life on social media. It's like, he's got a son. He's got. He's married. He lives in a great apartment. He's living this great life. He, wow. He's living his dream. Yes. And and I'm and so I'm on people's prayers, man. Yes. I'm on the wings of a lot of people's prayers, and I feel the weight of that responsibility far beyond my mom. But people who are friends of mine, people who saw me at a certain space in my life, mm-hmm. now they're seeing me live live my life in a space where they're like, he hasn't changed. Amen. But that's he's so gotten beautiful. better. Yes, that's, you know? that's success. Someone says, I don't, someone said to me the other day, they said, I don't want to see you better. I want to see you greater. Mm, that's good. And you, you know, and that's what I hear. Yeah. You know what I mean? They see yeah. your greatness. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what, when people say, have you made it? Or what your success looks like? Or this, that, and the other. That is major success. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I don't quantify it with how much money I make or anything like that. The money comes. I mean, it suffices me a living that I really enjoy and that I can share with with my family. And and that's that's success for me. And that's what I'm saying. That's the currency. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, there are those blessings. The emotional concern, currency, the fact that you have uh, an actual family and a foundational currency that we all miss because you can do all of this and people turn off the camera and they're lonely. Right, right. You know what I mean? For me to be able to invite people over to my my home that I can feel confident in, I can feel Mm -hmm. um, at peace with, but 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 that I, I I could I could welcome unabashedly, where I'm like, come over to my home, let's have a conversation. Yes. It ain't always been like that. No. Lord I knows, because I started that. off in a cracker box, like most people when they first moved to New York, <laughs> where I had you know I had more mice friends than like you know real friends. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, so, that's so good. That's so good. So you know, so for me to be able to now be in a place where. I live in a nice apartment. Beautiful apartment. I have a studio. I have this. You know what? I've got equipment. There's no reason why I should not be able to stay inspired and create knowing that I've been blessed with so much. Mm. And so for me to have two cameras, lighting, a yellow couch, mm-hmm. which I've covered it since I wanted red shoes. Natural red lighting shoe. with a view. Natural light with a view. I with, know. Without, a, without another wall right here, you get right. natural light. That's, right. This is a come up. That's, cur- that's currency. <laughs> that's a come up. That's a come up. <laughs> but, oh, my God, this has been amazing because, you know, we share so much in common. And I, 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 I feel bad that we don't spend so much more time together. And I really want to commit to do that. Let's do it. This year. And, you know, being here has been a revelation for me. Uh, I hope to you all as well for you to see a powerful black woman in the creative space that's moving the needle on so many different um, areas of her life. And for me to actually be able to call her friend. So thank you so much for being here, love. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, this is great. This is great. More of this. Yes. More of this. (laughs) So until the next one, you have a wonderful day.